I've got you under my skin. I've got you deep in the heart of me. So deep in my heart that you're really a part of me. Hello, today I'm going to be doing an interview with uh, Terry Dicka Volchoff. And this is her we her website, the Interior Freedom, the Interior Freedom Designer dot com. Uh, it's a really nice, simple uh, website. I'm excited to be interviewing her because what she does is very similar to what I teach in Language Lessons of the Heart. Uh, she shows you how to uh, change your inner critic. To, to inner coach, if you will. And she says, everyone is talking about what to feed your mind, what correct affirmations to say, developing a strong mindset to avoid all the negativity. All good, well-meaning, mainstream advice. However, there's one extremely important element, often avoided, crucial to your success. The truth is, you're fighting with yourself and all the inner belief systems that are locked in your subconscious. When you're trying to develop a positive mindset with affirmations and the subconscious mind is in control of 90% of the time, since the subconscious is activated or, or is, makes a decision, every part of you follows along like the Pied Piper regardless of what you consciously want. And this is so profound, I can't even tell you how profound this is because this is in the crux of that one a uh, few sentences is the dilemma of mankind. We have what we want and then we don't get what we want. We don't we get what we subconsciously want. So how to make the subconscious conscious and how to transform how to transform let's start your transformational journey today how to transform your subconscious into conscious and have them aligned so that you get what you want. And this is done by words which become programs in your mind. Ideas, beliefs, judgments, denials, these things, once they're floating in your subconscious, they control you. So there's a difference between your intentions and your intentionality. And this is why affirmations often don't work. No matter how much you're affirming, uh, making abs ab affirmations, if you have limiting beliefs, a bad self-image, self-sabotage doesn't work. You can't get past that hurdle. I'm Mike Harrell and uh, of the Language Lessons of the Heart series on YouTube and uh, today I'm interviewing uh, Terry Dicka. Uh, how do you say last, your, your last name, Terry? It's uh, Terry Dicka Volchoff. Terry Dika Volchoff. She sounds like a, a um, one of those superheroes, fights <laughs> the demons. Anyway, she has this uh, a fantastic process that she teaches people on how to restructure their mind, reteach their mind, and uh, and this is what I want to showcase today because I just think it's just a fantastic process, and it's she's so successful at it that it took me two weeks to get this interview. So uh, let's start with the obvious question: Is uh, how did you get started in your uh, in your line of work, and kind of a little bit of an overview of what it is that you do? Okay, great, thanks. Um, how did I get started? So I've actually been in the field of self development for a very long time, uh, probably about twenty twenty five years, um, because I always felt like there was something inside of me that you know there was a gap, there was some kind of gap. And, you know, some of those things helped a lot. But about seven years ago, I got really sick and I couldn't walk. And uh, because I had been in the field, I knew that I'd created this. Well, that was kind of hard to um, swallow. And, um, you know, set about on a journey to um, get myself healthy again and um, did some new work and new trainings. And um, so that's the work I do today and help people with that. 
And I guess what I found in that training was, um, and what really released me and the, you know, that locked body, cause I couldn't cross my legs or walk or anything, um, was, uh, an unconscious or what we call hidden loyalties to our family. And that was to my mother. And I guess, uh, I had decided long ago that my mother didn't love me the way I thought she should. And uh, one of the ways to unconsciously um, achieve or receive our mother's love is to be just like them. Well, my mother's been sick for 20 years. <laughs> so it's like, do you love me now, mom? I'm just like you. I'm sick. Although that didn't really get her love for me <laughs> the way I thought it would. But the work did. And I came to love my mother just the way she is. And I love myself just the way I am as well. And I can walk again and do all the things I need to do physically. So that's a short story of it all. It's a long journey. And uh, could you give us a the little... Uh, um before you go into the whole relationship of parents and children and subconscious, could you uh, kind of give it, give it like a brief overview of uh, what it is you do, what, it, what the actual thing it is that you do? Yeah. So um, I work with people who have all kinds of issues, sort of repetitive issues, I guess, or reoccurring issues or, you know, really um, life altering issues like I had. Um, and I, really listen to their language, um, uh, first of all, and listen to what they're saying about their life. And I can ask them that in a direct way, actually, just give me three words to describe your life. Because it's better to just get it short, short and succinct, because people will, you know, go off into all of the stories, and the stories don't help us. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what I do. And then I connect that back to a family member, the parents, the mother, the father, Oftentimes we work first with the mother because the mother is the first relationship we've had in our life. So our mother re represents life to us. If we have a good relationship with our mother and feel supported by her, loved by her, then we feel supported and loved by life and we can go out and do the things we need to do in life, participate in life, um, you know, do what we need to do to support ourselves. But if we don't feel that support, then, you know, we struggle in life and we find other ways to get our mother's support. So like the unconscious way I did and many other people do as well. And then we work actually doing visualizations um, to connect them back to their mother. So you can, act, you, you know, you can feel in your body what's happening when you face your mother visually. Um, just let her stand a few feet away from, your, from you and you can see, you know, whether you connect with her or not. And we do some work to help you connect with her. Also some work to give you perspective um, and new awarenesses of what really happened. And um, you open up your heart to have compassion for your mother. And this isn't something that we force. It's just something that naturally occurs. And we can have compassion for our mother. We can have compassion for ourselves and other people as well. And so that's kind of the gist of it. Um, and then we can work also on the father as well. Um, if you have issues with men, you have issues with your father. <laughs> it's all traced back to the parents. And then it can also be an ancestor. It can be a grandparent that we associate with or, you know, even some other trauma actually that happened in our life that was connected to not just a family member, but you know, somebody who uh, came into that field of ours, though our collective family field. So we, we, this work is about inclusiveness because when we don't include what has happened to us or who was in our life and who affected our life, we don't include, you know, what life has to offer us, if that makes sense. Well, I know it does. For me, uh, it's it's uh, my personal experience is I see when you deny one thing, it's it's it goes across the board. So if you deny your pain, you're going to also deny your joy, your creativity, your dreams. So it just kind of puts a damper on everything. So yes, that's it. That's it in a nutshell. Yeah, and you know, so we have <clears throat> work to um, help people accept everything 
resolve it and release it so it doesn't you know control you anymore because the uh these are like subconscious programs and ways of life knee-jerk reactions that we have and um they control us against our will and so when we release them we retrieve our will our free will yeah and you know makes me laugh because people say oh you know you have a choice well you don't you know not when you're in this paradigm this mind paradigm there's no choice um, I talked to several people. It's like, I don't want to be doing this. I don't want to feel this way. I want to feel this way. They know how they want to feel, but they can't. It's like a stuck energy, a stuck program that keeps repeating and attracting those same things into your life. Could you go back over when you talked about the release? Because I have a feeling that the release process that you're talking about involves a kind of a visually, vi viscerally in your body, but also has uh, something to do with like a, a, a imagination. Uh, could you talk about that, that, that specifically, that release segment? Yeah, so there, there's many ways that I can do that, actually. Uh, the primary way that I do that is um, to just have that once you have that connection so this your parents are a life flow energy once you connect back to that life flow energy you you do release what's in the way so what's in the way is anger and resentments judgments and denials all of that when we can, can connect back to that life force energy which our parents are they represented life to us they taught us what life was and we absorbed it like a sponge then if there were traumatic moments with your parents of course we get that stuck energy those stuck loops so this happens automatically when we can um the release comes because there's a lot of sometimes people have emotional you know um they cry <laughs> when they see uh when they even just stand in front of their parent <laughs> but when they see a new perspective you know it all gets released and this is standing in front of your parents sort of in, in your imagination it's like it's, a guided meditation where you you, you see that uh or, or relive that or connect again to that right Yes, it's a guided visualization where we can um, resolve this with our parents. So it's actually, we call it the spirit realm. I would too. Yeah. yeah. So it's actually sometimes, and you can work in this spirit world, um, you know, if your parents are gone from this world or not. And for some, it's actually almost easier <laughs> to work in the spirit realm than to work in the physical realm with their parents. But eventually, you can also connect to them in the physical world if they're still here with you. And um, so there's a lot of power in this sort of spiritual, uh, the spirit realm. and um, there's a lot of work we can do to change the physical realm. I, I could not agree more. This is uh, very deep and very profound. It sounds simple. The mechanics of one, two, three it is very simple. It but is. the implications, because you're talking now about so the spirit world, you're talking about karma, you're talking about past life stuff, and you're talking about being connected. Yeah. Uh, this is and this is this is the direction we're going as humanity. We have to, yeah. have to get this stuff sorted out. We really do. And you know, speaking of humanity, like there's a collective energy field for the whole world. We are globally connected now. And <clears throat> there are the polarities that we spoke of earlier where there's, you know, the the fear, <laughs> the terrorism and all of that. And then there's the movement to shift that uh, collective energy field. So, um, you know, we can do it individually and then we affect the major, the, the, the macro field. Um, when in this work, when we uh, work, uh, let's say in the micro, which is with the one person, the whole family shifts. You can shift the whole family field. And then that, and just one person needs to do the work. And then that affects the other, like, you know, friends who are in another family field, basically, also can affect them. And eventually, we can shift the world this way, and it's in, in need of shifting. Well, my testimony, Moni, on that is one of, the, one of the things that's put my nose to the grindstone of healing and transformation inside myself 
was that I saw that my held resentment and rage towards my ex-wife was affecting my son. And then that's what I focused on. That was like, I can't, you know, it's bad enough that I have problems. But I can't let my problems affect the next generation. I can't let it affect my son, who's very precious. So that's when I did all the releasing that I had to do with the, you know, face to face with the ex-wife in my imagination, resolving all that stuff, and and then 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 that led to my mother, the stuff that I had with my mother, and I had to resolve that stuff. And then once I got all that stuff resolved, my, at the time my son was away in school in North Carolina. I'm in Florida, and. Uh, and he shifted. Like <laughs> within three months, he shifted. He's not in the, in the same state. He doesn't know what I'm doing, but he shifted. And the relationship between the, my uh, ex-wife and I shifted. So when the relationship between my ex-wife shifted, he didn't feel the pressure of, do I love dad and hate my mom, or do I love mom and hate my dad? So he ha that was all gone from him now. Yeah. And then just... it changed just like that. That's, that's what happened. My testimony that this works. That is so beautiful. And yeah, and you know, then there's that polarity for your son. He's divided inside. He doesn't know, you know, who to go to, who to trust, and he can't trust himself. So that's what happens. And, and that's fabulous. Um, I too have seen a change in my children too. Um, as my actually career has expanded, so has their, has so of theirs. <laughs> and uh, they really my one son does know what I do um, and my daughter does a little bit, but um, not really. They're not doing any of the work. Um, <laughs> my one son's done a little bit of it, but uh, yeah. And you know, it's not like we're trying to take credit for what they've done. It's just that they are affected by us. They're in this collective field and they can't help but be affected by us. So it's so exciting to see not just your life start to change, but the, the other family members as well. Change for the better. Change for the better, absolutely. And more loving, and more all that good stuff. All the, all the cookies come with the with the package. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. It's it's beautiful, and um, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day, and she's a, actually a university student, and she said, you know, every student I talk to has anxiety. She says it's like you know they they freely say it, and um, and I thought you know. That's really nice that they freely say it because a lot of people hide it <laughs> and mask it, but they don't know what to do about it. And uh, so there's lots of options for people, and definitely the, the release work that you did um, is fantastic, and that inner visualization and the work that I do is very similar. Well, anxiety is a word that is meaningless. What, because you can't do anything with anxiety, but in, in, in reality, anxiety is fear. And fear yeah. is because somebody or some idea, some words or some vision is making you afraid. And it's happening on the subconscious level. So it's always ticking around back there. So it's afraid, it's afraid, it's afraid. I got to do this. I'm going to fail. I'm not going to get there and all that stuff going on. That's all it is. Anxiety is the exact same thing that you're releasing. Exact same thing that you're teaching. It's just uh, the word-based fear that yeah. goes on in your subconscious. And it's yeah. rampant. And depression is the same thing. It really is, yeah. And, and, you know, and it didn't start with the present-day moment. It didn't start with your present-day problems. It started back in time, either in your childhood or, again, with your parents and your um, ancestors. Something got passed on. So when we don't recognize and include members in the family, someone else, and we exclude them, someone else takes them up. It's like, I will be just like you, so you are seen. And um, <laughs> this is never more prevalent than in my own personal life, where um, my father, um, who had three sisters, um, was not anything like them, didn't seem to be anything like his uh, parents. And his sisters would say, and my siblings would say, like, who is he? <laughs> this is before we accepted him. <laughs> Who is he? Where does he come from? Even his own mother would say that. And um, it turned out that he was like an uncle, the uncle who was excluded. And I don't want to say too much about it, but um, he was sort of misdiagnosed with, uh, people thought he was, um, you know, back then, dumb, but he was actually deaf. And people didn't know that he was deaf. 
So he was the excluded member of the family. Unconsciously, he wasn't included because he couldn't hear or understand. My father kind of turned out to be a similar person, even though he could um, hear. Um, he became the excluded member of the family, the black sheep, if you will, to include this other uncle who actually had the same name. The fa wow. fa same first name and last name, obviously. I don't think they had the same middle names. There's another story where I know um, of a man who, um, you know, was estranged from his father his whole life. His father at this present time is in a wheelchair, doesn't have a relationship with him. The son ended up in a terrible accident in a wheelchair. So they, we have really, really mysterious ways <laughs> of including people in this collective field. And until somebody resolves that, these people will be included in really, um, you know, dangerous ways. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it, it can get it can get very subtle, and sometimes it can get very it's it's very tragic because if you look into the history of let's say uh, domestic abuse, you can trace that back five, six, seven generations. Yeah, and, and it's like, well, okay. And, and people think it's a genetic thing or something. No, it, it, is, it is the culture, the society, and then it got focused onto the family, and then that just rolled on down and, and rolls right through us into our children unless we, the responsible adults, stop it. Yeah. So, yeah, and we know we can't let our fear stop us from growing and doing the work that we need to do because, um, you know, there's an old saying, when you stop growing, you start dying. Mm. And it's really true. Um, so, you know, just whoever's listening to this, you know, don't let your fear stop you. You know, find a way to um, go around it or over it or whatever it is, dig a hole under it uh, and do the work because there is freedom on the other side. And love, too. I was talking to a, a fellow today. And I was saying, he was talking about how painful it is to tell your truth. It's so painful to tell the truth. And it's the hardest thing that human beings can ever do. And he, you know, that was his expose. He was a little snapshot of himself in the moment. And I said, you know, that's not true. Yeah. It's not true. It, what, what it is, is the resistance to telling your truth, to, to living your truth. The, the denial of telling your truth, that's what's pain, painful. Because once you go in there and see your parent or see your lover or you see the ones who hurt you and you allow that to unfold, then that collapsed love opens up again. And then what ends up is a particular kind of love that you haven't felt in that way for a long time. So it, even the most compressed feelings, once unfolded, are really love again. And, and that's, who was it? Uh, Carl Jung said, the darkness is... 90% gold. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about. You know, those struggles and strife underneath all that is really gold. They are the gold and they are the path to, to the gold mine. <laughs> you can't get to the gold mine without following that path somehow, some way. Yeah. yeah. And then you, it's, it's, it's completely crazy. But if you get sick physically... Or if you have a midlife crisis and the world falls apart around you, and then you recover, all of that, all of that didn't matter anymore because the love and acceptance and the feeling comfortable in your own skin, it was worth it. It was worth the tragedy. The tragedy just falls into no big deal anymore. Yeah. In the end, wouldn't you say it's one of the most fascinating journeys that you've ever been on? It's the hero's journey. That's true. And I've been on some wild stuff. Let me tell you, I used to be a yogi and I was like seeing light and all the world. Until you start healing and evolving your emotional body and your inner world. Yeah. That's where the real deal is. That is. Yeah. And I tried the meditation route too. And uh, I've, you know, I've been to India to visit gurus and I love the experience, but you know what? It wasn't uh, it didn't, it was actually in the midst of that that I got sick because I was in the middle of denial and I was in bliss. <laughs> 
And as you so aptly put, you know, you can't just stay in the one polarity. You go in a circle. Drag your foot. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, let's let's end this right now because that's a, a I think that's a pretty good snapshot. Why don't you uh, Why don't you wrap it up with your final statement and anything you want to add, like who to call or any kind of thing like that. Well, I just like to say thank you. That was a really interesting conversation, and um, you know, really think about whoever's listening um, about your children and acknowledging your children and their feelings and their emotions so that they don't have to do the work later because when it when we don't allow our children to express themselves and we try to fix them and you know you're okay and no you know buck up or or whatever um we um then uh tell our children that that it's not okay to be them and they stuff those emotions somewhere else and they are limited from that point on so just allow your children to and acknowledge yeah you're feeling sad and you'll see them turn around and be happy after you acknowledge that they were sad <laughs> or yes you're angry and you'll see them be grateful that you know you allowed their anger and they'll turn around and carry on with their life um, in addition to that um, i can be reached um, at uh, through my website uh, www.interiorfreedomdesigner.com. Also, I have a Facebook group. Um, it's called, at the moment, Unstuck Mind Authority Leadership Network. Um, it's probably going to be changed very soon. I had a little talk with Michael, and we've decided that that would be great. So that's coming up again. But uh, you can also find me, Terry Dika Volchoff, on Facebook, too. Yeah. I'm going to put I'm going to put the links down below. So Thank I'm you. really glad... Uh, and, and I think that you, you do this, these sessions with over Skype or Zoom or something? Yes, yeah, yeah. definitely. I do work locally, but um, with yeah. people all over the world. All the links are on, are on her website. And uh, you go there, and uh, you, she'll hook you up. And you, she's busy, like I said. It's wor it, what works, yeah. people, people hear about it. Yeah, yes. All right, thank you so much. You really affirmed and confirmed so much of what I've gone through. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, Michael.